I decide to go with the safe choice. I arrive at a local late night restaurant and bar that appears quite busy. I pull the door open and met with a vibrant atmosphere. My senses are warmly welcomed. Cheerful laughter and chatter dance in the air. The smell of grilled meats fills the cramped room. It feels as if I've stepped into a separate realm. I turn around towards the street. It looks so dark and depressing in comparison. I go sit down at the bar. An employee instantly acknowledges me. Good evening, miss. What can I get you? I'll have some chicken skewers and a beer, please. Coming right up. The walls are decorated with repeating patterns. I think to myself that they give off an image of sophistication. In this timeless place, I enjoy savory chicken along with a cold beer. Out of nowhere, I hear someone call out to me from behind. It's you! I'm sorry I never returned. You see, my break was over before I knew it, and after taking care of a few things, I simply didn't have the time to spare. I didn't even have time to turn around before a barrage of words had exited the girl's mouth. I glance behind me. I'm met with an eager pair of blue eyes, radiating glee. I've seen them before. Is this seat busy? No, go ahead. She sits down with a thud and a huge smile on her face. Who are you again? The girl looks genuinely upset. Charles didn't tell you? I'm actually offended. I'm his younger sister. I'm just visiting for a few days. The mystery of the cute girl's sapphire eyes has been resolved. She touches her golden curls as she goes on. So how long have you two been dating? The muscles in my throat contract. Beer goes up my nose. I almost spit it all out in reaction to the absurdly direct question, but I managed to contain it. I quickly put a napkin in my mouth and nose. The girl merely laughs at me. One beer, please. Not dating. We're friends and roommates, that's all. She raises her eyebrows slightly, clearly unsure if I'm serious or not. My name is, my name is Miranda, by the way. Miranda, A. Eh? Nice to meet you, Sophie. Nice to meet you, too. Oh, Charles told me where you were, just for the record. I'm not a stalker or anything. You weren't home when I came by the house, so I told him I wouldn't shut up until he told me where I could find you. Oh? So, I'm going to be direct. I don't have a lot of time, and I want to make the most of it. You know, I know my brother very well, even. It's not like he said anything to even insinuate, but I can tell nonetheless. It's evident he really looks up to you. The way he spoke about you is like he, the way one would talk about a celebrity. That boy's enamored, whether he realizes it is another question. She rolls her eyes, then takes a huge swig of beer. Nerves. Naturally, I had to see for myself. I get it now. She smirks at me, eyes glossy. You sure know how to make a girl feel singled out. If I had more time, I'd go easier on you. Comes down to this one thing, right? I only want the best for my brother. I... Shh. Even if things haven't developed into something yet, there's always a possibility. And I likely won't get to visit him again for a while. So that's why you're under investigation. I don't even know what to say. Things sure are moving fast. Here I thought I'd get a cozy evening to myself, enjoying a beer and some chicken skewers straight off the grill. Tell me about yourself. Charles said I should ask you instead of having him explain. That, of course, made me very curious. I'm sure. No point in brushing it off or changing the subject. Perhaps the alcohol's already affecting my judgment. Ever heard of a pop group called... Rings a bell. No, I'd have music, though. I used to be a member. Oh, of course. Something like the prettiest girls get to do. I shrug. It wasn't like that. And according to our managers back then, everyone could be pretty. If that was something they wanted. Sure wasn't an unpopular choice to go down that road. You mean surgery? Yeah. My confirmation seeds with spite. I see, yeah. I can see it being a thing. Did you have anything done? I chuckle. No. I used to think I was perfect. I disregard my manager's pleas completely. Which is ridiculous in hindsight. Not that I declined it, but... Why am I even telling you about this again? Because I'm a social butterfly with immense people skills, no? So you say. Can't even count the amount of times I heard comments such as you're a bit too fat, your lips are a bit too small, your nose isn't straight enough, your breast can use a boost. They weren't even directed towards me most of the time. It's just a thing of the industry. Words passing you by, in the air around you, sometimes they'd stick. It changed me. That life changed me. Ultimately, I realized there were certain things more important than appearances and wealth. In fact, nothing's about appearance and wealth. 
supposedly that such things are lonely and misguided, blind to the industry's true purpose. The most attractive thing is passion and a heart of fire to guide you towards your dreams. I know, so cheesy, but really though. Anyway, we had it. Offer it wasn't our dream. We just thought it was. We were just manipulated into believing as much. I don't have a dream. It took me a long time and many occurrences to realize that much. Sensitive to alcohol, are we? She chuckles. Sorry, I'm blabbering, aren't I? I'd be more embarrassed than I am, but it seems the alcohol has temporarily inverted my normal introverted personality. Yeah, but don't worry about it. You're saying interesting things. You know, most people haven't a clue about the industry, I'm sure. The cream of the crop. All they see are the pretty girls and their hypnotic charm. I know, because I'm one of them. That's all I really see. She smiles radiantly. The eye-opener is appreciated. Miranda pulls up her phone. Pulls up her phone out. She fires off a barrage of letters while muttering. Well, to mend my hangover tomorrow, I know what I'm listening to. Oh. I don't have any mean to say anything else. Bartender, two more beers, please, and thank you. So what do you do, Miranda? <laughs> that was Miranda's text bubble that was saying that. That was supposed to be Sophie. I'm glad you... Or was it supposed to be? Well, I'm glad you asked. I'm an art tutor for children. Mostly those of prestigious families that make me go all over the country. That's cool. Sure, children always are. She looks away, her expression turning cloudy. But... The parents... Infuriating isn't enough to describe them. They think their worth exceeds anyone else's. It's my job to shape their son or daughter in accordance with the parents' ideal. That's what's expected from me, at least. They're just children, so they play along. I know this. I know all this. I was thinking, you used to be like one of those children, didn't you? You're not far off. It's just... It wasn't my mother's ideal. It was society's and my egocentrical desire to reach the mirage called perfection. It sounds so ridiculous when you put it like that, huh? But that's how it was. I owe my mother a great deal. If it's one thing I can't really blame, it'd be my mother. She wasn't able to reach me. It crept me and I regret. I found myself staring down my beer. My voice faded out because there was no will left in me to finish the sentence. Sorry. Could we change the subject? Naturally. Anyway, twelve more hours and I'll be on my way again. Where to? Some flashy area far, far away, I'm sure. And I can't find the time to find stable relationships to get into because of work, friendships, or otherwise, which is sad. It's not because I'm highly neurotic and a workaholic, I swear. Huh? Charles likes you, I'm sure of it. Well, I like him too. I'm sure, but how much? Don't stress it. I just wanted to plant the seed, so to speak. Who knows, I might be totally off the mark. But you have my approval, girl. Just for the record, you know, since we likely won't be seeing each other again for a long while. That's actually the reason why I found it so easy to talk to you. Yeah, I lied. I'm not normally like this, so... Oh. I'm usually cold, stuck up, just like the people I work for. A product of my environment, or what is it they say? She laughs. The fake kind. The sad kind. The depressed kind. The familiar kind. You put on a good act. Sure, yeah. Really, though. Thanks for giving me a break from my usual facade. Who I showed you is my ideal self, not my current self. It's okay. I'm glad I could at least do that for you. Anyway. You, however, should go easy on the alcohol. She laughs hysterically right at my face, trying to force the cloudiness out of the atmosphere. Two beers, and you're telling me your entire life story. Well. Lonely? I know it all too well, girl. Anyway. I think it's about time I get going. Travel day tomorrow and all. The girl stands up. She gives me another examining glance. See ya, cutie. I click my tongue as Charles' high-strung sister storms out the door, leaving me to pay the bill. Jeez, does it run in the family or something? Soon, I reluctantly pay the bill and head out to the dark winter night by myself. I wander home, pay no heed to the clock's incessant ticking, progressing towards the future. My mind is empty, but it's the good kind of empty. 
Awakening to experience inner peace for a brief moment makes me feel like I'm walking in clouds, my feet crunch against the snow. My hair is wavy and all over the place, and I don't care. The cold winter air feels refreshing as I run my fingers through my hair, allowing them to enter the nest that it is. I close my eyes for just a moment. The night is quiet, but my mind is playing me the most euphoric, uplifting tunes. Mysterious chords skillfully execute arpeggios, atmospheric percussion giving life to the song, and a soft voice filling the remaining void with nothing other than humanity. They occupy my head in an instant. Music's unexplainable magic empowers me and gives me hope for the future. One of Winter's lovely symphonies. By the way, thanks for the heads up, asshole. It's past dinner time. Charles has returned from his lessons, and I promised to show him my favorite spots around the outskirts of the city. We're walking side by side out of the city center while talking frivolously. Naturally, I have just the place in mind. I punch his shoulder with just the right amount of force, so as not to kill him. Me? Asshole? What gives? Your sister. Oh, that. You even have my number. A text would have sufficed. Well, I thought you two would hit it off just fine. That's besides the point. The next time you text me, got it? So, you're like best friends now? I want to erase that stupid grin off his face. No. Trust me, I know my sister. Her text said it all. My ears react like a dog's. What did she say? That's a secret. I hit him on the shoulder once more. With me taking the lead, we've arrived at my one and only snow-covered hill. It's as deserted as ever. The only sources of light are the radiant clouds hanging over the city and the astral sea above us. I walk up the hill and sit down in the snow, as if I were alone. But I'm not. I glance over at Charles. He's building a comfortable mound of his own. After a moment, his behind hits the fluffy snow. He reclines the gasps, wearing a childish smile. His eyes dart all over the place, taking the beauty of everything before us. Wow, it's amazing. I feel as if I could see all the way into your grumpy old neighbor's massive mansion if I had super eyes. I can't believe you kept this all to yourself until now, you selfish bitch. What did you just say? I know I didn't quite hear that right. Thanks for bringing me here, so... space before us, we returned to silence. The night went on in silence. I 
I turn around in my bed, again and again, I feel restless, and no matter how many times I turn around, I can't seem to get into a comfortable position. The air is getting stale in here. My skin is warm and itching. Annoyance is building up within me. Moreover, paranoia. Lately I've been having nightmares of past events. Flashbacks to a time where I had to actively keep my guard up wherever I went. I still do to some extent, but nowadays it's in a much more relaxed manner. The feeling that someone could be anywhere at any time waiting for me, with the intent of hurting me and those close to me. The feeling that used to be more of an everyday reality. Now, due to these dreams, I feel that same old feeling once more. As I think these things to myself and tell myself how silly it is to be worrying about it now. A shudder, followed by a mechanical noise and a blinding flash. Panic hits. Blindness hits. In reaction to the noise, I pull my covers up above my head. My voice is weak, so the words turn out a whisper. What. The. Fuck. I feel like crying. But I can't. I can't seem to move at all. My limbs are frozen in shock. My thoughts are still as well. The only thing I'm capable of doing is stare at the silhouette on the other side of my blinds. Seconds pass. The silhouette is still. My mind is racing, however. I'm starting to regain the ability to think. I don't dare get up. Somehow I have to scare the person off. I don't trust my voice on the slide, so I need to do it through other means. I grab a nearby book. Sorry, Haruki Murakami. I throw it at the window with full force. The flat face of Dance 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 hits the window. A huge bang is produced. No glass is shattered. While its impact wasn't enough for the glass to break, the noise was plenty for the silhouette to vanish. After a moment, someone knocks on my bedroom door. Sophie, you okay? No. Charles enters the room promptly. I can tell he's straight in his eyes. The room is evidently too dark for him to see properly. While trying to assess the situation, he rushes up to me. What the hell happened? What was that bang? I sniffle, but my voice seems alright now. Someone was taking pictures outside my window. So I threw a book at them. What the actual... Charles runs out of my room, and I can only assume he's heading towards the front door. Despite what you may think, this was a first for me. I've dealt with various unpleasantries during my life with similar intentions, but they've never been so close. Never in my own. I realize I'm shaking slightly. I detest this feeling. The feeling of being observed. The feeling of knowing someone out there has their eyes set on me. The feeling of being singled out. I didn't think it happened here in my hometown of all places. But maybe that's exactly why it did happen. Not many minutes pass before Charles returns. Charles? He enters my bedroom once more. Couldn't see anyone out there. Must have been quick. Jeez. Do you think it's related to... I don't know. Might be. If it is, they aren't even letting you live in peace in your own hometown. Fucking pisses me off. Cowards. So real quick... You have to remember, due to the winter landscape, there would have been footprints outside of her window that he could have actually used to track the guy. Charles is freaking lazy. That's usually how it is, I guess. Obsessive cowards. Yeah, maybe you should go so stay somewhere else for a while. Wouldn't know where. Literally anywhere else but here. I don't really want to, though. I won't be bullied out of my own home. Are you sure? He looks serious, as if trying to figure out if I really mean it, or if I'm just putting on a face of bravery. Would you be surprised if I said I was attempting both? Let's take some precautions. You get to sleep in my bed tonight, and I'll sleep here. Just in case they come back, if that'd make you feel better. I can't help but let out a few chuckles. Don't worry about it, this is fine. Let's make sure all the windows and doors are locked properly, though. And I'm placing this here. From a nearby closet, I pull out a screen used for room dividing. Thought it'd come in handy after getting a roommate, but not in this way. I place it in front of the window, adding another layer of obstruction. I suddenly feel a bit dizzy. I need to sleep, and I'll be fine, so don't worry. Alright. Good night. And I'm sorry you have to experience things like this. Can't believe it's some people's everyday life. I'm used to it. Yeah, and that's awful. 
I say this, but I don't imagine it's the first time I've had it happen in my own home. I don't want to worry Charles for no reason, so I leave out this piece of information. Good night, and thanks. No need to thank me. Sleep well. He exits my bedroom and closes the door. My room remains in darkness. I look over at the window, where the room's divider now sitting. Anxiety is still lingering within me, but I really do want to overcome it. I won't let anyone have that kind of power over me. I stare at the ceiling and begin to count sheep. Surprisingly, it doesn't take long for my eyelids to grow heavy enough to stay shut for the night. The next morning I wake up. My eyes open as they always do. If they didn't, I'd be worried. I look around my room. It's just like any other morning. The dirty clothes littered all over my floor. The stale air of un my unventilated bedroom. The pounding headache because of it. Sun fills my room, but blocking the windows is a room divider. I get a sinking feeling in my stomach. It's not any morning. It's the morning after a home visit by some creep photographing me from my own front yard. I shudder. Morning. Oh, what are you still doing here? At this time, Charles should have already left for his classes. I told my teacher I'd be late. I wanted to make sure you felt alright, you know. That's kind of you. Well, I'm fine, though. In fact, I need to get going myself soon. So you go ahead. All right. Charles leaves, leaving the house very quiet. Pangs of uneasiness hit me, but I'll be fine, won't I? I'm fine, right? I told him as much, so I have to be. I prepare myself for work, possibly faster than I ever have before. Everything to get out of here as fast as possible. Out on the street, I quickly lock my door and look around me. They could be around the corner, following me, observing me. I feel paranoia taking over my reason. I hear the sound of the shutter and repeat in my head. I walk. Fast. I look over my shoulder again and again. When I reach the main street, the amount of people makes me freeze in place. I can't move. All those eyes. All those people. All those potential hunters. It could be any one of them. They would know me, my looks, and my motivations, but I wouldn't know them. I wouldn't know the first thing about them. They could look like anything, and I could only guess their motivations. After all, they visited my home in the middle of the night with a camera, so is it really wrong to draw the conclusion that their motivations and limits are scary? One always assumes the worst, right? Why is that, I wonder? They could approach me, ask me a question, anything and I still wouldn't know it was them. I feel exposed and hunted. The fear of the unknown is incredibly strong. I tremble lightly. I thought you got over this type of issue at this point, Sophie. Shit. Maybe I should have just stayed home. But that's where the incident happened. The nervousness has spread to my stomach. It's as if it were on fire. It's trembling and complaining. Get over yourself. I force my legs out of place and move towards the cafe. Good morning to you, Sophie. Hey, Etta. In a second flat, a cut goes through the air around us. Seriousness. Her eyes pierce me. She can tell I'm not fine. I'm sure of it. Anything the matter? I decide to be open with her. There's really no reason not to. And I might feel better with her knowing. There was an unpleasant incident last night. I'm a bit shaken. Customers have not yet arrived. The cafe is empty aside for Edna and her daughter, who's lurking in the kitchen behind her. Morning, Jenny. Hey. So, out with it. What happened, dear? Well, it was the strangest thing. To most people and to me ever since I moved back to this town. I was about to sleep when I noticed someone taking pictures outside my bedroom window. They must have been in my front yard. They knew where I sleep. How awful. What an absolute pig. Did you call the police yet? No. Somehow I hadn't even thought about it. How come that wasn't my initial reaction? The only thing that came to mind was how powerless I felt, and how scared I was. You should. I should, shouldn't I? But 
but I'd rather just not deal with it. Feels easier that way. Sure, it might feel like it, but what if it occurs again? You need to look out for yourself, dear. My stomach sank as the meaning of her words reached me. Now I know I'm out of it, because I hadn't considered that either. I think I might be in a state of shock or something. Lord, are you trembling? I didn't notice it myself, but my hands are shaking slightly. Etta walks up to me and puts her hand against my cheek. You're pale. Paler than usual. And you're the palest girl I know. Take the day off. You need it. I can't help snorting derisively in response to her order. And go where? Oh. Let that roommate of yours keep you company. He's enrolled at the local university. He's there right now. And before you say anything else, I don't want to be the reason his learning is halted. I'd rather stay here and distract myself. You stubborn woman. Can't say it's the first time I've heard that. Alright, stay here, but take it easy. Don't hesitate to take a break. And if you don't, I'll make you. Thank you. My husband's friend is in the police. I'm going to call him, he's going to come here and take a statement later. You got it, dear? Oh, okay. The clock turns five. It was a day like any other work day. While the fear had mostly subsided thanks to Edda's comforting aura, it still lingered in my mind. Each time a customer smiled at me, I couldn't quite return it. Why? Because it could be them. On some level, I realized how ridiculous I was being, but it's more difficult than you think to break this way of thinking. The police statement I gave went fine, too. We sat down for a coffee in the back as I retold the story for the third time. He was kind and understanding. It made it easier for me to share. He didn't say what they'd do or when, but now I've at least done my part. I stand outside the cafe. It'll soon make its transformation into a bar that has coffee in their selection of drinks. Hey. Hi. Jenny, isn't it? Not Jennifer, right? Yeah, you got it right. Ed only ever calls you daughter, so I wasn't entirely sure. She chuckles. I see. Also, thanks for walking me home. It's not a problem, and you know, my mom can be hard to convince otherwise when she's got an idea about how something's supposed to play out. She smiles. Anyway, let's go. No time to waste. Darkness is closing in. Sure. Do you smoke? I do not. Good. Me neither. She smiles meekly. I hope you don't think I'm being nosy, but I heard about what happened for my mom. And then there was the police, so it was hard not to notice. Anyway, sorry it had to happen to you. Thanks, but it's not like it was random. Yeah, I know. Still. So you're pretty famous, huh? I don't know about that. But you have fans. I guess so. Do you think it's a fan that's after you? I guess so. That's the only thing I can say. Sorry, I'm bothering you, aren't I? No, not at all. I just don't really know what to think. It'll be fine, right? Yeah. Alright, here we are. You really didn't have to do... You didn't really have to, by the way, or... Uh... I mean, I'll see you tomorrow. Right, see you. Still smiling, she leaves me at my doorstep. I'm staring at my ceiling as thoughts rush through my head. Once again, I went to bed with the room divider covering my bedroom window, knowing it's the only thing staying between me and, uh... Stalker? That's the correct word to be using here, isn't it? For some reason, I thought I'd be able to escape everything, including this, by returning to my hometown. But I guess I was naive. They can't go anywhere I can go. They can go anywhere I can go. So there's nowhere I can really hide. From somewhere within me, rage suddenly emerges and begins to course through me. I clench my fists and my head begins to throb. How fucking dare they put me through this? It quickly subsides. A feeling of defeat. No, resignation comes over me. It's not like I know who they are or what they want. I don't know anything. Maybe the best course of action would be to just ignore it for now. Yeah, I'll try not to think about it. They don't deserve it. My fear, that is. Screw them. I 
never run into Jenny before work. Hey, Sophie. Jenny, hi. The cafe is still some blocks off. We walk side by side towards our destination. Um, Sophie, you seem a little bit off. Is everything okay? I'm alright, and if I'm not alright, I'll get over it. That sounds sort of depressing. Don't mind me. I'm alright, really. As alright as I can be. Just my usual self self efficient humor or something. Anyway, thanks for asking. Don't let a Debbie Downer like me ruin that great big smile of yours. She beams. You like my smile? How could I not? In the couple of industries I've been in, a great big sincere smile like yours is absolutely rare. Absolutely, absolutely rare. It's these sorts of small things that really help me get through the day. You're embarrassing me. Moving on, I've got a quick question. Which way is it you live again? Me. Ten minutes away. That direction. Oh, right. It's actually about ten minutes for me too, but going that way. She points towards the west. I live in the south. Apartment. Yep, you. House. A big, wonderful house all to myself. Except one certain dumb oaf of a roommate. She looks worried. Are you having trouble with your roommate? Absolutely. I mean, no, that's a no. He's a... Yeah, a dude. Don't ask. If you met him, you'd know. Wow, a guy? So, is he your boyfriend? If a big dumb oaf like that ever became my boyfriend, I'd never forgive myself. I'd baptize myself in a pool of acid. Jenny giggles. The fact that you can talk about it like that must mean both of you are quite close. Ever heard of the scorpion and the frog? I think that reference went over her head. She stares at me quizzically. Never mind. So if you don't know the story of the scorpion and the frog, the scorpion needs to get ferried across a river or lake, some sort of body of water, and the frog's willing to do it for him. So the scorpion gets on the frog's back halfway through their journey in the middle of the deep water. Scorpion stabs the frog, and they both start sinking as the frog succumbs to the poison. Frog asks, why'd you do that? And Scorpion's answer is, it's my nature. So the whole thing is, it's one of those stories like... A cheetah can't... Or is it a leopard can't change its spots, I think? Or the farmer and the snake, for example. That's another one that has the same moral. People can't change their natures. The main thing is that we're as close as two rattlesnakes intertwined. All fangs and whatnot. I see. So you don't have a boyfriend. Bad thoughts of Lyrian fans and headline scandals whisked through my head when I pushed them away. Now, something like that never happened, but it was a legitimate concern back then. And in case you're wondering, that is true. The absolute worst example I can think of is there was a Japanese idol who had to issue a formal apology for getting married and having a kid. Fans can be utterly psycho. Never. It's my lifelong dream to become a spinster. But you're beautiful. And if a girl like you can't get a boyfriend, then I must be royally screwed. I let out a small laugh, but I probably blush too. Charles has flattered me in this fashion before with zero effect, but to hear such praise from this wide-eyed, innocent little lamb is a total heart killer. I have changed my mind. Jenny, will you forever be mine? What? It's just a joke, but there's no way a person like me, all lost and stumbling on this crazy earth, could ever be truly attractive. I think you're definitely less lost than I am. I don't mean to be patronizing, but that sounds to me like a case of youthful lack of experience. You'll eventually grow out of it, probably. On the other hand, with my sort of lostness, even I would want to marry me. Perhaps I could get married to Sophie Dunn. Jenny seems a little sad. I get flustered. But who cares about me? Don't listen to this cynical woman with too much of a penchant for self assessment You're a hard worker and you're driven, so you'll definitely get far in life. I try to salvage the conversation. Let's change the topic. Come to think of it, given your age, you at least have some dreams in life, right? Goals to achieve, like things you'd like to do, places you'll go to, and all that Dr. Seuss stuff. Come on, tell Big Sis Sophie all about it. It's not really interesting, actually. Really. You're trying pretty hard to convince me of that. I'm not sure I believe you. Jokes. Truth be told, actually, I've heard a bunch from your mom already. Her mouth gapes. She didn't. 
Your mom is a real blabbermouth, all right. I guess it comes with the job. You can't just run a cafe on food and drinks alone. You need a real social atmosphere, too. Anyway, singing to him. I'm embarrassed. Mom's such a blabbermouth. But hey, those are some good dreams. What's there to be embarrassed about? Music is what makes life worth living. That line was, in a sense, insanely hypocritical, hypocritical coming from me. But there was something about the mood Jenny was in that made me feel I had to skew the truth a bit. Act all mentally. It's only an interest. I'm not really that good at it. I start from somewhere, too. Well? She begins to fidget. Then, with some conviction. I was actually thinking of asking you. Lessons. But if it's too much trouble... I mean... And I didn't feel appropriate to bring it up since you've had all this stuff going on. Can we just pretend like this never happened? I thought about it for a while. It's not like I have much to do in my free time other than verbally sparring words with Charles. I suppose I could serve as, it could serve as a distraction from all this stuff floating around in my mind. Maybe it wouldn't be so bad. But then again, you could describe that kind of career as the sort of game where you have a few winners out of a mound of losers. As much diligence as might be, a f as much as diligence might be a factor, you're screwed without some kind of talent. And if Jenny couldn't reach the standard, I didn't want to be the one to have to break it to her. So I came up with a plan. Okay, I'll tell you what. You know that big of a roommate I was talking about? He's into playing the guitar. He strives every single waking, painful moment of his pathetic, insignificant life trying his very best to make something of himself. Unwarranted optimism. The worst kind by far. Anyway, moving on. I'm going to be brutally honest here. I won't teach you unless you show me you have the guts. Unless you show me you're willing to dig out your raw, bleeding heart and put it on a platter for me. I try as best as I can to make my voice sound as rough as a drill sergeant, to intimidate her. But on the contrary, her eyes widen into big puppy dog eyes. Really? You train? Uh, yeah, I guess that's what I'm saying. But only if you're dedicated. I'm talking the type of training that might make you bleed from every orifice. Despite my attempt to terrify her, force her to really reconsider. She smiles even wider. Hey, no. You're not really going to cry, right? It's just, I'm really happy you gave me this opportunity. You're the best. Even with the whole orifice bleeding heart ripping thing? Mom always thought I should just aim for a comfortable life working at the cafe. It wasn't a bad idea, but I feel pretty useless. Pretty small the way I am right now. But I want to do big things too. And you'll really help me, Sophie? I sigh. I can't possibly deny a face like that. Shoot for the stars. But just be warned that it might get too hot for your liking. What am I saying? I feel like I've gotten a sudden case of verbal diarrhea. What am I really telling this naive girl? Hot is good. I've had enough of the cold. She was so excited she was jabbering the whole way to the cafe. The day went by without a hitch, but I couldn't help but glance at Jenny every once in a while. Heat. It's the rush of warm blood that keeps us warm. The nature-given grace of every mammal. And the lights were hot when I was on stage. The absolutely glaring, blasting lights when I sang. Her eyes were like those thousand lights illuminated. The same went for the tears that fell at night, when no one was watching. She knew nothing of those. But heat was the very thing caught behind that innocence. Heat fumed and flamed in that small body's hearth. Heat was transferable. Her eyes gave me the impression she was deep in thought, and there was a fire within them that I hadn't seen until now. So I thought this, from one falling star to a rising one. Good luck, and I'll wish for your eternity, friend. <laughs>